Uh, let's figure out what that means. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, we're going to talk about such a, an interesting topic, uh, invariant risk minimization, which, which was proposed by Martin Arjovsky in this article. And uh, let's start with a simple um, example. So, imagine that you had a simple classification task. You wanted to classify between cows and camels images. So, what's the problem? I just take a convolutional neural network, a bunch of images of cows, a bunch of images of camels, I feed forward, back propagate, and uh, eventually I receive a, um, a model with a very low training loss that seems to be able to predict between cows and camels. So, what can be the problem? Well, the problem is in this image. Um, it seems that the, color, uh, the uh, images of camels have this you know, sandy beige background, whereas uh, the images, of course, has these green, grassy, uh, nice landscapes. So basically, our network just uh, cheated. It uh, averaged the color of the background and uh, predicted the output. And this feature is really very strong, but it's spurious. It's not the natural cause of things, not why images actually are are images of cows or images of camels. And here we come to the classical co correlation versus causation dilemma. Uh, you see, our modern machine learning algorithms tend to absorb all the um, correlations they can find in data. And in data, we can find a lot of spurious correlations that are induced by various biases. Those biases can be some random factors or our uh, way of collecting, processing uh, data, uh, anything else. How, uh, anyhow, we always have these spurious correlations in data that we don't want to learn. And uh, we have a very non-trivial problem. We want to identify uh, those properties of our data that describe uh, spurious correlations and get rid of them and identify and use useful prop properties that represent the phenomenon of interest, like animal shapes in our example. Uh, so what will be, uh, so we can notice that uh, those spurious correlations are not stable. They tend to vary from data set to data set or from environment to environment. Whereas uh, true causal uh, features, properties are invariant. They are stable. They present in all environments, in all data sets. So um, we can use it to build um, predictors that will generalize well for new testing environments. And uh, by the way, the authors of this article also uh, notice that shuffling that we commonly do in our, uh, for our training is not that okay, because by shuffling we destroy the information about how the data distribution changes from data set to data set. And hence, uh, we can no longer follow up on which features are stable and which features are not. Uh, so we make our lives uh, more complicated. Sorry, are you referring to mini batch shuffling? Uh, no, just shuffling of data. Shuffling of data says that that's the order of. Exactly. Yes, because we, we have a very strong assumption about the identi uh, identically distributed independent data. Where, but. Uh, uh, you know, when you collect uh, your um, data objects from different environments, they are not identically distributed. And when we mix them and receive one big data set, we destroy this information about how it changed. But that's just a side point uh, stated by the authors. That's not the main like, idea. What you're afraid of is just uh, you have a single data set, but it's collected from different environments. Yes. And you don't want to shuffle the environment. Yes, you don't want to shuffle uh, data from different environments into uh, one big data set. Okay, so uh, what will be our strategy? Um, we will assume that our training data, data is collected uh, from several distinct separate environments, okay? And uh, uh, we will promote learning such uh, algorithms that will absorb uh, only stable uh, correlations across these training environments. And we will hope by that that they will generalize well for new testing environments. So in our uh, example, that will be uh, very simple. We can just 
for instance, collect calls, uh, calls images from different countries. As you can see, uh, calls in Holland always pasture on such juicy, greeny, grassy uh, landscapes, whereas uh, calls from Corsica uh, actually have background very similar to images of camels, right? And uh, uh, using these separate environments we, with different landscapes for cause images, we can hope that our um, invariant promoting algorithm will notice it and get rid of this strong but spurious correlation. Okay, uh, here we come to the spotlight of the paper, the principle, the invariant risk minimization principle. So it says that in order, in order to learn uh, invariants uh, invariant predictors, we need to, su to find such a data representation that a um, classifier on top of that representation would be optimal in all environments at once. So I understand that this is not clear at all by, by now, but uh, by the end of this talk, I hope that things will get more apparent. So let's uh, be more concrete. Uh, the basic formulations. Uh, so we consider that we have several data sets. As I said, they are collected from uh, different training environments that are a subset of all environments possible. Uh, and our goal is, as always, to predict uh, output from our uh, inputs, right? And we will um, promote such a minimization, su such an objective to minimize. It's uh, basically, it's uh, maximum risk across all environments we have. So you can see that RE is just empirical risk in environment E. So why that, uh, why that goal makes sense? Uh, let's consider the following example. So I'll write it down because we will need it further on. So we, we have three variab two input variables, x1, which for example is Gaussian with varying uh, noise output which causally depends on x1 plus some varying noise and the spurious uh, variable which depends on the input plus some fixed noise for example. So um, Basically, our environments can vary in, uh, uh, first of all, in the magnitude of the noise, of course. As you can see, for example, uh, we, have, we can have two training environments with two different magnitudes of noise. And also, uh, the authors state that we can uh, vary the structural equations for our input variables. For example, for x, x2, instead of this equation, we can have something like, I don't know, uh, y in y squared plus some Gaussian noise or just a constant um, 10 in 6 degree, anything you want. Uh, the, the thing that remains stable is this cause, causal uh, correlation between x1 and uh, output y. Uh, okay, so we have this uh, set up and we uh, imagine that we are just building a linear regression on top of it. So we can regress from only x1 from our causal variable and obtain uh, these coefficients, 1 and 0. We can re regress just from x2, the spurious variable, and obtain the following coefficients. And we can regress from both and obtain those coefficients. So uh, you can clearly see that only the first regression actually is um, stable across uh, even our two uh, environments that differ by the magnitude of noise, whereas the second two are not. So uh, we can um, clearly see that the true causal uh, dependency be between x1 and y um, induces invariant linear regression. And uh, so yeah, that's what I just said. x1 is... Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, regressing from, the set, from X2 is bad. Well, because you, you have um, it's bad, we'll see it in this statement. Because the first, uh, the first regression, this one, 
from x1, the true causal variable. This is the only regressor that has finite uh, out of distribution risk. That uh, maximum empirical risk across all environments. Because, as I said, we can vary this structural equation. And if we tend, in, if we have a testing environment which has a very high x2 var variable, we will have an uh, infinite error, infinite loss. You see? So. Well, it's not clear because uh, if your x2 in testing environment is uh, again just y plus some noise, it would be very good to regress yes. some x2. But our out of distribution risk is, I will return to, is the maximum risk across all environments. So in some environments, it will be okay. Actually, in our training environments, those regressions are much better than uh, X1 because our noise in X1 and uh, here is much higher than in our spurious correlation. You see? So just. So Yes. So it's kind of a, there is a mis clear mismatch between the two distributions. Yes, yes. That's exactly. Uh, because we cannot uh, have as much environments as we want. We only have several environments. But that doesn't this mean that here it's like a clear data connection problem? So it's like uh, one should not be solving a problem like that if it's uh, like uh, uh, if you need action to solve the problem. Well, uh, we can solve this problem. This, this is what this article is about. So even if, if when we have not all environments possible, when we have just a subset of training environments, we can actually identify which, uh, which dependencies are true causal and which will vary from environment to environment, which will not generalize. So uh, let's make it clear. Uh, is <coughs> yes. Ah, you, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in the uh, small environment, you have a large error. So mm -hmm. your, your quantity will force you to minimize your error on the small environment. Yes. Well, basically, uh, this example just shows that this out of distribution risk is something that makes sense if we want to uh, to search for true causal dependencies in data. We can we can uh, reason on this for uh, we we can find some drawbacks of this loss. Basically, it's maximum loss across all possible environments. It's absolutely infeasible in practice to minimize such a loss. But uh, in this example, this loss actually helps us to uh, fetch the true causal uh, regression because. Uh, all the regressions with non-zero non uh, x2 coefficients would have infinite, as we can vary this structural equation, infinite loss. Uh, so that's more or less uh, clear, okay? I, I hope it will be more clear uh, further on, because... Very no, no. Yes. So <laughs> why this is better? Like, better than why what? Why can't we just mix all the environments together? Well, because if we mix all environments together and we will minimize just empirical risk across all environments, for example, okay, here we have these two environments. If we minimize empirical risk, we will receive this regression, right? This if you minimize this in one environment, not in both. In both, actually. But you have E, what is E then? Like E? Is environment, uh, this e, noise? E, there is one E and 
not too easy. Well, you have two environments, two data sets. Each data set is collected from I I its environment. <coughs> and then to, to minimize empirical risk, you uh, unite them, maybe shuffle, and then you build the regression uh, formula for a regression equation, and you will receive th these regression coefficients. Uh, but why, why, why is it, what, what is E? Is it yeah. first or it's second? One, it's one environment. Because before you said that we were training in one environment and testing in another environment. No, 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 no. We have several environments to train, but we need to use them more, uh, more cleverly than uh, in just empirical risk minimization. Mm -hmm. which is one variable, and that's two, which is another variable, from the same environment P. No? Well... Where are two environments here? Um, okay, I guess that this index here is... Uh, well, it means that... So but the x1 and x2 are the two features. So there are two features, and yes. they, they are correlated, they come together. So if they one, are in the same environment. Yes, but you, have, you can have multiple data points from different environments. Yes, as you collect, you see, you collect uh, your data sets from different environments. So you have several data sets, each one is collected in its environment. Okay. So does that make sense? Uh, More or less. You do what I said you can do. So you just mix all the data together and mm -hmm. train on this data. Yes. Uh, why is this bad? Because you will... What uh, here? Last time you are getting data points to two numbers, x one and x two. You need to like regress. Yes. You don't know e. uh, well, okay. If you mix, you will not you will not have this uh, index e here. But if you regress in each of these environments, uh, those. We, we, we didn't have. Uh, e is uh, like different sources of data for training. E represents different environments. It's an, it's the environment. Yes. Okay. But like. Uh, what, that, like at the test time, there is no, you don't know which environment the data point comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, there is a third feature which tells you the environment. Yes. Would you please answer to my question? We mix them. Why is this bad? I don't understand because there is no uh, answer on the I, slide. I, I, I'm sure that the, the, what you are suggesting, that's a baseline. That should be different. So that's a one way train. Uh, uh, and then we will see experiments yeah, and say this the, the, the will be better. better than this. But like, do they have some intuition? Why? Why what? Why, why we shouldn't uh, just put all the data together? Because you're talking about the next slides? Yeah, yes. Maybe, maybe if we like, let uh, them continue, yes. we will explain more of what's to come. Yes, uh, exactly. That's I what mean, I want. You're talking about cows and digital task for this question. That's the answer is because we can have camels on the, on the grass also. That's a good point. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so uh, if, you, if you don't understand any details by now, it's okay. We will go further on and <laughs> things will get, I hope, more apparent. Well, it, it, at least you can uh, look at the paper. It's a very good paper. So if you want to really dive into it, I encourage you to download the article. So OK, now about uh, how we can solve the problem of generalization uh, or like prior work. Uh, the first one is simple empirical risk minimization, right? Uh, but it doesn't work in our example. Because uh, for empirical risk minimization, we have training environments with very high noise uh, with the variable x1. So our empirical risk will promote correlations with x2. And then we, when we will receive a testing environment with very high numbers of x2, for example, absolutely different structural equation that we didn't uh, meet in our training environments, we will have infinite or a very large uh, loss, empirical loss. So. Empirical risk doesn't work here, okay? That's okay. Is it clear why it doesn't work in this example? <laughs> no. <laughs> so you sum over environments here with empirical risk. Yeah. So empirical risk minimization just, uh, it's a simple strategy when, when you just uh, want to minimize the, the sum of 
uh, empirical risk in first training environment and empirical risk in the second training environment. Yeah. Uh, that's what is proposed initially. That's our like uh, super uh, wanted goal to, to to minimize the maximum risk over all environments. Because if we will have such a predictor that minimizes our risk across all environments, it would be good everywhere in all possible environments. But that's that's an infeasible uh, optimization task for us by now. Uh, Okay, so empirical risk doesn't work, really? Yes? Well, believe me, it doesn't work. <laughs> Next, we, we have such, a, such an approach. Okay, so we're gonna just like, uh, we're looking at these two things. So, okay, so uh, Y depends on X. Uh, there is a correct causal dependence, but the noise is high, so you have a normal distribution with a uh, sigma, which is like 10. Mm -hmm. Like 10, which is high. Mm -hmm. But then you have all anti causal dependence mm -hmm. on uh, x2. But then the noise is very low. Mm -hmm. So x2 is almost equal to, to y. Why isn't it a good idea to just give x2 as an output? Yes, that's yeah. what empirical risk would do. Empirical risk. So why, why isn't this the best possible strategy? Because correlation, in, in terms of correlation, correlation is much higher. It's why, why do you care about causality if you, if you, if you just do prediction? Now, because in training environments, because you trained on some... You might have spurious correlations. You might have camels on green grass and cows on sand. And then, okay. which a model learns to classify grass and sand. I understand the example, but I don't understand this example. This example, so, I'm explaining. So, okay. There is a big gap <laughs> So, you, uh, when... Okay, is it clear then that if you um, minimize empirical risk in this, uh, for this model, with very high noises, you will promote a learning from this uh, variable, right? X2. Okay. Then you have testing environments, which has something like this equation. So it instead has a very low loss here, uh, yeah. noise here. Uh, the same, it, it, should, has, it sh should have the same uh, or similar up to the noise uh, magnitude uh, structural equation here. And then it has x2, which is basically constant, and it's 10 in 6 degree. Then your uh, predictor y equal to x2 would have super high uh, mean, loss that's here. That, that, that's super, you change the structure of the problem. So you, yes. you just removed the, one of the dependencies. So it's like, uh, if you're training on one model, like uh, in one environment, and then you're getting something totally different, which has no connection with it. Yes, one, it's not. It's not that. totally different. It has. It has. It's not. Why there is no dependency of x two on y with like say like the same last line? That's what I would buy that one. Okay. Because this is the spurious correlation. Because we are trying to find causal dependencies, like in in Bayesian network. If we build the Bayesian network of this model. We will have something like this, or exactly this picture. So the, the causal correlation, which should not, uh, this is our main assumption here in this article. Our main assumption is, this, uh, this, uh, is that this connection does not uh, depend, uh, does not vary from environment to environment. We can vary like these noise connections or this connection we can vary, but this remains stable. The causal, uh, this is an, an inductive bias, of course. This is our assumption, assumption. But it seems to be something reasonable. Okay? So now, robust learning. So, okay, empirical risk doesn't work, unfortunately. Robust learning. Well, a robust learning seems to be something uh, very close to the out of, this, out of distribution risk, because you see that we also maximize our empirical risk, but uh, now we maximize only across, oh, sorry, uh, only across training environments, minus some, uh, like it's called environment baseline. Uh, this environment baseline uh, helps us not to focus too much on noisy uh, training environments, whatever that means, uh, but uh, it turns out that, and we will and we will show that very simply, that this uh, 
robust learning is actually a weighted version of empirical risk minimization. Because you see that uh, if we want to minimize across all the predictors, the maximum uh, risk of this predictor, uh, this is basically the, uh, the following constraint optimization task. We want to minimize across F, M, M, where our, oh, I forgot the baseline, where our risk minus baseline Is that okay? That's okay. I just rewrote this in a similar, in we equivalent. Have problems with the same e for the maximum variable and for this particular small r. So you should you should have e hat or e star. So it's a specified environment. Uh, no, I have I maximize here across some okay some some. So you maximize the. the Abstraction. I, I, I try to minimize this uh, this thing. I try to minimize. You're minimizing the difference between the risk and R and the baseline, right? I, I, minimize. I try to minimize this thing. Yes, you just needed some brackets. So I, I minimize across. I minimize the maximum. No, the the, the, uh, the question is about what you have under maximization. You have either difference between two terms under maximization, or you have a difference between maximum and small r. And what is small r and purely e? Mm -hmm. Those are two new symbols. Uh, okay, now uh, let's follow the line. First one, uh, what's exactly the problem? Uh, I what just is small r e? Small r e is some constant e, uh, that depends on uh, the, the environment. So in each environment, in each training environment, it would be just a scalar value that we subtract from the ah. I need brackets yes. here. The question was about this. Yes, here there must be the brackets. Okay, so I, I'll put it also here. Okay. Uh, what is this thing? Yes. It's called environmental baseline and it's needed for not focusing too much on noisy training environments. But that's another paper, it's not this uh, environment risk invariant risk minimization. It's a constant which is just unknown for some environment or does it, is it like... Uh, it's a constant. It's, it's unknown, yes? Uh, yes. Uh, it, it, we try, uh, basically we can uh, try to approximate it like in you know in reinforcement learning in reinforce algorithm we add a baseline and there are several techniques for this but I'm not familiar with this approach but there that's an optimization tool to reduce variance of the gradient estimator and here that's like uh, some cost that's like a constant which depends on the environment the mm -hmm. property of the environment yes but is it known or not known like no it's not known where we we select it we select uh, usually, we so basic robust learning is trying to minimize the biggest difference, minimize across all across all environments. Sorry, minimize across, across all, all environments. Predictors. The, the, the difference. Sorry, predict. Uh, e is environment. No. No, no, no. Uh, yes, it's environment. But robust learning tries to minimize across all the predictors yes. that maps inputs to outputs. And what it minimizes? It minimizes the, the maximum uh, baseline subtracted uh, risk right. over so all. It's trying to minimize the biggest error across all, like, so across all the, like, so across all the different environments. We're trying to find the, the place where it's making the biggest error, mm -hmm. minimize the biggest error. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. Okay, but, but like uh, that is in that you need to have access to all the environments at training, because if yes, then why not like uh, the previous examples. Then ERM will work as well if you have all the terms. Yes, of course. But that's why we need these baselines that will. Well, that's just an approach. And I, I'm going to show that this approach is equivalent to weighted ERM. So we came to the constraint optimization task, right? Then I write KK, KKT. Uh, so just <laughs> the derivative.
So I just put the uh, derivative of, of my Lagrangian uh, to zero. And that derivative with respect to, to my to f, to the predictor. And that derivative basically is uh, um, sum by e of uh, gradient of lambda e by gradient by f of And we assume that our uh, risk is a good convex function, and this is equivalent eventually to f, which is which uh, uh, on which we have zero uh, gradient of Lagrangian is actually an argmax uh, and argmin across all the uh, predictors of that weighted. Sum. Okay, so basically this is uh, the weighted version of empirical risk minimization, right? This, this, uh, those are empirical risks in in environments, and for empirical risk minimization, we would have those lambdas uh, equal, equal to each other, right? And this is just like a modification of empirical risk. So this will have the same drawbacks as empirical risk minimization for our task. It will also promote learning uh, spurious correlation. Uh, okay. You say the nandas are not necessarily equal. So maybe some examples where cows are on in the desert will have much bigger weight. Yes, uh, it may have much bigger weight, but it depends on how we choose our baselines. And uh, uh, we're not talking about, uh, now we're not talking about that uh, like imaginary example with cows and camels. We're talking about this uh, example, very simple example. But it's, as we see, we already have two methods that can cope with this problem. Now, the third one is uh, uh, promoted by many uh, uh, different authors, for example, by Viktor Lempitsky. Uh, domain, domain adaptation principle. Uh, we want to, well, the, uh, the formulation is very simple. We want to find a data representation uh, which has the same distribution across uh, all environments. Okay? Uh, but the authors of this paper uh, claims, claim that uh, this may sometimes lead us into wrong type of invariance. And actually, they uh, dedicated the whole section in their appendix to explain why uh, domain adaptation is not good. But in our example, it's obvious, because the true causal variable x1, it has a varying distribution across environments. So uh, our invariant uh, representation of data will not be as we want x1, 0. And uh, it, w it will not work for us as well. Uh, and finally, uh, so-called uh, invariant causal predictors, prediction, uh, the idea is to find a subset of variables uh, such that the uh, regression, the linear regression on, to on top of that subset would have uh, equally distributed residuals across environments. Okay? Uh, so, Basically, this is somehow um, a state-of-the-art method before this one, uh, which I'm gonna, which I'm about to present. And uh, but his, it has several drawbacks. For f uh, the first one, it's always it's always uh, assuming linear regression. The second one, it search for a subset of variables, and uh, searching for a subset of variables in a high-dimensional. Uh, tasks is absolutely infeasible. And, and uh, the third point, it also doesn't work, work for us because we have varying noise uh, <coughs> from environment to environment. So uh, invariant causal predictor will also not help us to learn the true causal dependency of uh, y from x1. Uh, so it seems that even for such a simple problem, uh, we cannot find 
the true causal solution. So is everything all right by now? I can, yes, I can transform. But it's, as you can see, we, here we have only a subset of environments, not all environments. So I can also transform uh, my uh, out of distribution risk into a weighted empirical risk, but across all environments. If we have all the environments uh, possible, it's okay. We can learn empirical, we can learn empirical risk minimization predictor. It would, it would work fine. It would actually be optimal for us if we had all the environments. But when, when we are constrained to several ones, uh, we cannot uh, afford this. So, yeah, it seems that even for such a simple uh, example, all the state-of-the-art methods in causation learning seem not to work. And here we are approaching the in, uh, formulation of, of invariant risk minimization uh, but first of all, we need to define what are actually invariant predictors. So, um, I say that, uh, for example, I have uh, assumed that I have a data representation which maps my inputs into some space H, and I have a classifier on top of that representation which maps H to my outputs, and I say that my predictor W by phi is invariant if, uh, if and only if, my classifier is the optimal one across environments from some uh, uh, set of environments over uh, no, not here. Cross all the classifiers. Uh, on top of that representation for each environment. So that's basically the definition of invariant predictor uh, proposed in this paper. Um, well, the authors, the authors claim that this is something reasonable because uh, it actually uh, reflects the concept of induction in science because uh, you, you know that, for example, in physics we try to we're, we're not focusing on concrete object uh, representation. We try to find some abstractions. For example, for the gravity laws, for the gravity law, it doesn't matter whether your objects are apples or stars, planets. It doesn't matter. We try to. Uh, get rid of everything irrelevant for us and just leave uh, useful causal features. So uh, that's why philosophically this definition is something that uh, really reflects uh, invariant predictors. Uh, is this definition clear? Okay, so uh, now we uh, proceed to the formulation of the uh, Yes. Does this mean that this implies uh, this definition? No, it, it, it does not. And actually, those things are really similar. And as I said, the authors uh, provides the whole section of, uh, of discussion on this topic, why domain adaptation and IRM are uh, absolutely different things. But simply, uh, simply saying why domain adaptation is something we, we don't want is, uh, for example, say that uh, we have two, we have a one training environment and one testing environment. So for example, uh, yeah, so we have X collected in training environments and out. Uh, you can you can use access from the testing data set in domain adaptation. Sorry, is the basic idea is that for domain adaptation you need to know 
what uh, you, you, you need to know your target domain, and here you're trying to be domain invariant to begin with. Isn't that the basic idea? And a domain adaptation, like okay, I've, I've trained my speech recognizer on English uh, with an with an English accent, and now I'm doing speech recognition of English with an American accent. I know that I'm doing it with an American accent. I've adapted to that information. Or I can make a speech recognizer which is invariant to the properties of accent altogether. And isn't this the basic difference? Well, this is one of the differences, yes. Because it's much more general thing, this one. And in, the, in, the, in domain adaptation, you actually really want to ad adapt for a new known uh, somehow domain for an, a testing uh, set. Uh, but uh, you, in domain adaptation, you actually don't care about the outputs. So if your t test and uh, training environments have uh, the same distribution of access but different dif distribution of outputs, then your domain adaptation would fail because... Yeah. So, you, so you have to so you basically adjust for covariate shift? Uh, yeah. Domain adaptation is for covariate shift, basically. And this one is uh, a more general thing. Uh, so yeah, the formulation of IRM. Basically, it's the, again a constraint optimization problem. <coughs> Uh, you see that we are trying to minimize across all the accessible representations and all the accessible classifiers. Uh, we're trying to minimize empirical risk on our training uh, environments, but we are constrained to use only invariant, according to this definition, only invariant predictors. So we're minimizing our empirical risk across invariant predictors. Because, for, in, for example, we can take zero uh, like zero constant predictor, it would be invariant, apparently. Because it's constant. It's even intuit in, on intuition sense, it's uh, invariant. But uh, it will be useless. So we are trying to like, uh, me, uh, solve the min-max problem. We are trying to get, rid, to get rid of everything irrelevant and leave only useful features for our prediction. Exactly. Well, this is this is a very good point, and I also think of the uh, thought of that. But uh, you see, uh, the authors say that this is just a, like a theoretical theoretical uh, um, a formulation of IRM because it's impractical. We have very strong constraints. We, they are infeasible in practice. And for practice purposes, we have this version of IRM. Um, yes, you. yes. Uh, so you have a constraint optimization problem, but I, didn't get, I haven't yet. Why? Why can't you just take this uh, WV from RV and this would be the, the solution? Because, as I said, uh, you can uh, um, zero predictor would be uh, um, would be invariant. It would be argmin across across all zero predictors. Yes. For, I mean that, uh, for example, consider. Okay, if your feature extractor is just zero, then zero predictor is but, uh, okay. Um, well, not zero predictor, but a constant predictor. Yes. If, you're, uh, if you map your inputs just to zero, so you destroy all the information of your inputs, then uh, a simple constant uh, classifier, as it's called, would be, uh, would be invariant. You just take the mean of outputs. Well, uh, I think that's uh, they they do not uh, make this thing clear. I mean, uh, they, they 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 do not have this point in their article. Like, they have just this uh, formulation of invariant risk minimization, and then they try try to uh, develop it. So it's basically trying to again minimize the empirical risk but subject to invariant predictors. Not all invariant predictors are good, but those that are good are 
we will be good in all environments. But if this constraint is satisfied, it doesn't mean that we, we only need to, to solve the optimization problem with respect to phi, but rather than with respect to W. Because yeah. W is already... Under yes. Uh, as you can see, we, ca we have no minimization in our practical version of IRM, and we are going, we're, we're going to discuss it. Can, can, can you fully explain that equation? With this one? Yes. We, we're going we're gonna to move to it. It's going to be fun. So those things happen to be uh, related, <laughs> but it's absolutely not clear why. And we're coming to the trip to, from IRM, from the classical formulation to the practical one. The first step will be very simple. We will just uh, um, rewrite our constraint optimization problem into soft uh, constraint problem, which is just penalized with some regularizer, which actually uh, this regular, regularizer uh, is uh, penalizing us from being non, not optimal in environment E. Okay? That's what uh, his purpose. And we assume that it's nice differentiable function, etc. And the first term is just empirical risk. Yes, uh, uh, this is the same. Right, we, so we just empirical risk plus, plus uh, regularization. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah, 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 because we have uh, E, so there should be parentheses here. Okay? Uh, very simple. Now, uh, we assume that our classifiers, those W, are always linear. This is a very strong assumption, and uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but, okay, for now we assume that we will only deal with uh, linear uh, classifier and arbitrary uh, data representation. So consider just a linear list square regression, uh, then we can analytically write the optimum, and uh, uh, we can propose uh, a very simple penalty. Uh, Every incorrect brackets uh, the first part, you should first uh, take an expectation and then inverse. Well, yeah, you should have also. The authors of this paper do not like the parentheses. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you're, uh, you can just uh, propose the following uh, penalizer, which is very trivial, just a squared uh, norm distance, square distance towards the optimal solution. Uh, but you see, we have this matrix inverse here, and it's not very nice thing. So we will just multiply uh, both terms, uh, both vectors by this matrix and we will uh, and we will receive, we will obtain a similar penalizer uh, but it will have much nicer properties that are uh, depicted in this figure. So what, what is represented here? Uh, basically the, those are uh, plots of two penalties for, uh, for the same example as we had. Uh, assume that we are trying to find a, a, a very simple representation that will be as follows. We will remain uh, x1 as it is and multiply the second component by some constant c, which is parameter of our mapping. And uh, we remember that our optimal solution is c equal to zero and uh, opt uh, is one, zero, okay? This is the true causal uh, predictor that we want to learn. And uh, here, basically, we have the graph, the plots of uh, those uh, penalties uh, for different values of c for different uh, magnitude of the second uh, spurious component. Uh, so we, we measure the distance between the solution given, uh, for the given C of empirical risk, of uh, least squares regression, and the optimal uh, classifier 1, 0, okay? So we can, we can see that uh, the second penalty behaves much better than uh, the first one, and even the first one in a very regular, in a uh, strongly regularized, uh, for, for a strongly regularized uh, linear regression. 
So we will use it further on. Uh, so that's clear why this thing is better. Well, basically because we got rid of the matrix inverse here, but uh, the authors also provide some uh, graphical intuition on that. Okay, so now, <clears throat> okay, uh, we have regularized um, optimization problem with linear classifiers and uh, our penalty would be, uh, would have the, this form. Uh, we go on. So we can see that uh, assuming linear classifiers, we have uh, over parameterization because for a given pair of classifier and representation, we can just multiply them by some invertible transform psi and uh, receive the same predictor, right? Can so. Circle is just uh, mm, a superposition of function. Okay? So you, you just apply one function after another. Uh, and uh, okay, let's just constrain ourselves. Very simple. We will assume uh, we will fix some non zero classifier tilde w and uh, just um, optimize only across representations such that the optimal classifier, again, on top, on top of that representation, is, uh, has this non-zero value. So we got rid of the optimization across uh, classifiers. Yes, we just non-zero. We just fix some non-zero vector because uh, we can, it's clear from this uh, uh, equivalence. So, so it seems to be like reasonable, okay. Now the fourth step, well, basically that means that we can just take uh, first, the first basis vector and uh, use just the first component of our representation and everything will be all right. So we will receive this uh, optimization, uh, so, so we will receive this optimization problem eventually. And by now, Probably you ask yourself, what's going on? Is everything all right? Didn't we mess up somewhere? So the authors provide the following theorem. And uh, uh, it's a very simple theorem, don't worry. They have much, much worse theorem, but we will not touch them. Don't be afraid. So I, want, I, I w would like to um, first formulate it more simply. Before you begin, W are the weights it's a linear classifier on top of our representation. Right, so, right, so, so it's the weights of the f phi's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right, it's the vector we multiply. It's, l it's like in, neur in neural network. You map your inputs to some final uh, layer, yes? Yeah. And then there is just linear regression on top of it. Yeah, 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 okay, I got it, yes. Yeah. So that's, that's intuition. Okay, so the theorem actually makes things clearer for the linear case. Well, for, uh, it actually says us what are uh, invariant predictors in linear case. So we say that the, okay, we have, say we have axes which belong to R D and one dimensional Ys. And uh, the set of in linear invariant predictors, yes, the predictor is just linear regression. So it's just V transposed x equals y. Uh, so the set of such v's that are optimal, that are invariant, and according to definition what that means, that means that we can represent our v as some phi transposed by w, where phi belongs to r p by d, and W belongs to some RP, such that our classifier is optimal across all environments. So, uh, such that mm, W is argmin across all the W tilde from RP of our risk of phi transpose by WP for all 
environments from some set of environments. Okay, and this, this uh, set of invariant linear predictors is actually the set of such vectors from Rd that um, are orthogonal to the gradients of risks. Um, Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, okay, well, a very nice theorem. It makes things more apparent, at least for the linear case. And uh, uh, I will uh, define this as G E V, okay? Uh, where? Here? Yes. It's um, some number. We will see it. <laughs> well, it can be it can be one actually. So, so for one object, it is one. No, it's not. Uh, it does not depend on the uh, number of objects. It's just some number. So uh, this theory means that uh, the optimal linear classifier uh, predictor, which can be represented as some matrix, some matrix, or, or for some p. Uh, as phi transposed by W, where W is argmin of risks across all environments, uh, is actually the set of vectors which are orthogonal to the gradients of risk. And but phi is the same, an expression for V and an expression for W. No, for here w there exists. Not here, line with one. Okay, so uh, for this set of V, of vectors v, there exists uh, there exists such matrix phi, such a number p, such matrix phi, and such uh, vector w. That v is phi transposed by w, and w is argument of risks. So let's prove it to make things actually apparent. Mm. So here I will prove the necessity. And uh, okay, so uh, what actually means that W is argmin? Okay, I read, rewrite it across all the Ws from RP of risk in. Well, basically, okay, we assume that our, uh, that our risk is convex, so we can rewrite that, uh, that in similar gradient manner. So it means that the gradient with respect to W of risk... Could you just use one um, Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, w of P transposed by W is zero, and uh, I take the derivative. Basically, this is just uh, phi by the gradient with respect to V of R E. This is V. I remind you of V. Okay, so this is the zero vector. Then I multiply this zero vector by by W from left. And I receive W phi W V R V is zero. Should be W transposed. Uh, this should be transposed. And this is V transposed. So we showed uh, have shown this part. Yes? Okay, now the sufficiency. <laughs> or um, I don't think that you will see it here, so we will not actually need it anymore. I just wanted to show it. We will need sufficiency to explain our ideas. But isn't the proof is, uh, the same, or just in the reverse order? Mm, it's a little bit more um, some 
it has some peculiarities. So the opposite way. Okay, we have a vector that is orthogonal to the to all the. So okay, we have a vector v, which is orthogonal to all the g evs for all the for all e's from some set of e. Okay, uh, this is equivalent to v being orthogonal to the. Oh, sorry. Orthogonal to the span. Of those vectors. I'm sorry. Why are we proving this right now? Uh, to show actually uh, why we. Can we state the? Uh, I'm really lost. Can we state the result? Is lost. Everybody is really lost. Okay. Let's just get like let's just get the result and, and, and get to the point. Okay, let's get to the point. So basically, okay, uh, this theorem shows us that we can actually really um, search among one rank representations. So we can actually restrict our classifier to be just color multiplication by one, okay? And uh, for the linear case. But we can generalize for, the, uh, for any other cases. And this is the illustration of the theorem um, Statement, uh, basically, uh, we can see that the solutions of our uh, invariant linear predictors are uh, just, they lay on the intersections of L ellipsoids, where ellipsoids are uh, induced by this equation for the MSE loss. For the MSE loss, this equation will, will be just ellipsoids because it's squared function. Well, never mind. Uh, I understand that uh, I'm also tired. It's, all, it's okay. But actually, this shows us that uh, we have a very uh, a big drawback of, linear, uh, of assuming linearity of our uh, classifier because zero is always, solution, is, is always a solution. And, okay, we will not dive into details. It's just a bad thing. And the authors say, say that they will consider the nonlinear case in the future work, okay? But in this work, we assume linearity of our, uh, of our classifier. And finally, we just uh, rewrite... Why zero is solution? Because it's orthogonal to, to any vector? Uh, why zero is solution? Yeah. Well, because uh, zero V is... So it's orthogonal to any vector? Yes, yes. But uh, can we just well, exclude this degenerate case? Well, basically, the authors say, say that in our... Uh, in our IRM, this uh, empirical risk term will tend us from the zero uh, representation. So it's, it's okay in practice, but they, they are going to consider it in the future work more, uh, in, the more de in more details. Okay, so we just rewrite the, uh, the, lo the penalty that we introduced earlier in, in a general case, in this case, because those two uh, coincide for MSE loss. So if we have our risk as just squared uh, error, then the gradient with respect to the classifier would be this uh, uh, equation. Excuse me, why we don't exclude uh, the vector with 10000 because it's for four, four Using the same reasoning, we can, as for zero, zero point, we can exclude uh, also this factor because it's, like, it seems unuseful for us because we don't uh, take into account uh, yes. the rest of the... We're, basically, we're excluding this because you see in our practical formulation of IRM, uh, our ma we have a, a direct mapping from inputs to outputs. And here we need this dummy classifier, which is just a scalar m multiplication by one, just to take the derivative. Just to put it to PyTorch, so it can autograd and uh, count the derivative, which is our regularizer, wi which seem to be able to uh, help us achieve invariant solutions. Okay. Now... We will skip this, don't worry. Invariance, causality, and generalization. Uh, well, we can believe that IRM promotes low error and invariance across training environments, okay? But we have several questions. Uh, 
Does it promote environments in all uh, invariance in all environments? Does it promote low error in all environments? How do uh, those things actually connected, like causation, statistical invariance, and out of distribution generalization? Well, please see the article for details, because uh, well, I can explain it for those who are interested after this talk. Uh, but uh, the details are really interesting because uh, the authors provide all, the, all those, they, they answer all those questions for linear case. And even for, for linear case, they require differential topology to, to answer those questions. So if you're interested, please. But the answer are like maybe, maybe. No, no, no. The answer are uh, th these big theorems that uh, says when. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Are there certain conditions? Like a proof by elimination, yes? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. OK, experiments, our, uh, our favorite. So the first one would be a little modification <laughs> of, of our uh, first example that we had on, on, the, on the blackboard. Um, OK, so uh, this is just a little bit more specific um, structural equation model. We have also now like a hidden latent variable here and uh, uh, a little bit more uh, difficult equations. Uh, they also consider eight uh, different experimental setups, uh, which each one is uh, uh, each one is encoded by the the these three parameters. So the first parameter is scrambled or unscrambled observations. That means that if we can observe x as they are or after some orthogonal transformation. Uh, is experiment fully absorbed or pa partially absorbed? So basically that's uh, our hidden variables uh, do mess into our model or not. And uh, homoscedastic and heteroscedastic, this is just the position of noise. And uh, uh, those are the, the results. So let me explain what you see here. Uh, for each of eight experiment types, you see, for example, FOO is fully absorbed, homoscedastic, unscrambled. Okay? So for each of these eight uh, experiment setups, they, uh, they uh, plot two bar plots. The first one is for the causal error. And the second is for the non-causal error. So this is basically the error for the coefficient of x1 and the, coefficient, and the uh, spurious coefficient x2. So they say that, as you can see, IRM, which is green, IRM has the lowest uh, causal error in all the experiments. But sometimes it has uh, worse loss uh, for non-causal variable than uh, invariant causal prediction. And the authors say that their method is much better. Uh, ICP is just more conservative because uh, we are focused only in learning causal uh, predictors. So believe me, it seems that IRM works. And to prove it even better, I would uh, like to introduce you the MNIST experiment, of course. We're coming to the uh, two-label uh, spurious correlated MNIST. Um, we have a binary label, which is 0 for uh, first five digits and 1 for the rest five. And then we also flip uh, our uh, labels that were received this way with a probability 1 fourth. It's like a noise in our environment. Uh, and then we, have, we introduce this spurious correlation between the color and uh, the output. So we will uh, color our image into green. Uh, if we have color index 0 and into red if we have color index 1. And this color index is uh, received by flipping our label with some probability which is dependent on the environment. Okay? So this, the setup seems to be uh, rational. And in training environment, those probabilities of flipping are relatively low. So uh, this correlation between uh, color and uh, label will be very strong in our... Oh, sorry in our training environments. However, it, it changes from environment to environment. Uh, so we can hope that our invariant predictor will notice it and get rid of this spurious varying correlation. And 
for our testing environment, we uh, on the opposite set this probability to a high value. So our uh, predictors that use this color feature for their prediction w will fail. Okay? And here are the results, they just compare against simple uh, empirical risk minimization uh, setup. So as you can see, ARM, as it can be uh, anticipated, uh, ha has a very low training loss because it uses color, but it absolutely fails on test environment. Whereas IRM seems to be more or less robust. Uh, and here we have, uh, for example, s several uh, other baselines. Those are random guessing, which is 50-50 as always. Uh, optimal invariant model, hypothetical. So hypothetically, the best model could achieve 75% accuracy because we have this uh, random noise in all environments. And uh, uh, they also provide uh, an oracle model. It's like uh, empirical risk minimization on top of grayscale uh, images that do not uh, they, they do not hit the color, so they are invariant. What, what's, what's your model? What model? Is it just a linear model of uh, mm. images, or is it? No, it's a uh, yeah, multi-layer perceptron. Why do you need this uh, 0.25 percent of? Uh, well, it's like uh, it's like um, hidden um, variables that we cannot observe, but that. Uh, those, okay, it's li like a noise, okay? Just a noise. I don't know, they, they just set it for the generality. So in, in general environments we can have noise in our outputs that we cannot uh, do anything with this. And so... And be for, uh, at the training stage just two environments are known? Yes, we have two environments with uh, low, but... The, the there is a kind of uh, in invariance with respect to these environments, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which allows us to uh, perform more or less okay in the case of a third environment. Yes. Which was and, during training. and as you can see, the testing is in, it's absolutely different from the training environments it has. And also, I would like you to think with me about this plot. Mm -mm. It's the same thing, but no. uh, such that uh, given their representation, you cannot distinguish between the two training environments. I also had this question when I read this paper, but it seems like they are not too fair because, with uh, us. Uh, I have kind of a strong impression that under the hood, <coughs> if you like, uh, just look at the method, it's very similar. It would be like super similar to like one of the techniques. But Something done like with uh, the one which, say, like from Victor Lipinski and U.S. Afghanian, which is in Yorkie. Mm -hmm. Well, instead they provide the discussion on that topic. The first one, yes. Those, th that spurious colored mnist <laughs> is their invention. IRM and, and the color mnist. Maybe. Well, maybe. We'll discuss it. Uh, we can discuss it after the, the talk. They explicitly, they explicitly constructed a task where there, there are very powerful spurious correlations to be had. Uh, spurious correlations are in the color, not in this uh, flipping probability. That's why I don't understand why we do it there. Why? To Probably your hypothesis is pretty, pretty close to the two. To the two. I, w I would assume that uh, with all this noise, the results are pretty bad. Maybe ERM just works. Maybe. It's yeah. just like, you need to like, uh, screw up to, to make it not work on this. Because, well, uh, with this noise, I think that uh, we're making well, uh, pixels less informative. By, uh, so by, we by make and, uh, when we're making uh, towers more informative. And we, we, we make it uh, well, explicitly to uh, our ERM classifier to rely on color. Okay, and. That's a uh, masterpiece of experiment design. <laughs> How to convince everybody that your bad model is actually. Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, as a reviewer, I would be so pissed off about that experiment. I just create a group Sorry. It's just like a. Uh, 
That's why you added share of tips. <laughs> okay. So uh, one more figure. Um, the authors al also provide uh, their uh, the probability of output being one uh, conditioned on the logits on the h is just phi of x it's just the, the last layer of our uh, network okay so h are just logits and they plot the probability of output being one against the logits and they claim that as you can see empirical risk has uh, absolutely different mm, distribution for the testing environment whereas or oracle has uh, the same distributions and irm like two has has the same distributions but i actually do not understand and i couldn't find it in their code how do they plot the probability of output being one against the prediction of uh, the network against the logits maybe some monte carlo estimate but they, they didn't make it clear, actually. So those are just some more plots, if, you, if you're interested. OK, and uh, finally, an information theoretic view. That's literally five minutes. Uh, so that, that uh, ther information theoretic view, I encountered it in this blog post. And I found it really interesting idea, really interesting uh, viewpoint for, uh, for this concept. Uh, so basically, the, uh, the author of this blog proposes to look at uh, our uh, task in general, uh, like this, uh, like generally uh, this uh, Bayesian network where we have environment, we have some latent variables or noise, we have causal, uh, features and spurious features and of course output and our main assumption is, is that given uh, inputs uh, given causal inputs and noise we're independent of the environment so this is the main assumption in uh, such a graph representation of the paper okay and our uh, task is to learn such representation of our inputs that uh, our output is as much as possible independent of uh, environment and also this representation should be somehow informative about our outputs but that's very close to the informational bottleneck isn't it because in informational bottleneck we're trying to uh, learn such a representation of our data which uh, takes the least from the inputs it gives the most to the outputs right and uh, for this case uh, we can rewrite uh, IRM principle in this form. So basically, again, we're trying to uh, maximize mutual information between our uh, outputs and representation, uh, but we subtract the mutual information of our uh, outputs and environment given our representation. So something reasonable, right? It's very close to the penalized version of IRM that we already see, that we have already seen. Uh, but uh, the author ev goes even further and uh, says that we can actually receive something like this uh, from the informational theoretic point of view, the, the equation of this type. And he does the following. He represents the mutual information, the conditional mutual information on uh, the representation of our outputs and environment. He does some math juggling we, we will not dive into details but it seems to be reasonable he explains it uh, in more detail in his blog but with some mathematical juggling we can uh, approximate mutual information between our outputs and environment with this uh, equation uh, then uh, instead of minimizing here over all the parameters of our predictor we can minimize only in uh, some neighborhood of this uh, value theta and uh, this actually is uh, the negative here we have we should ha we should have the two on top it should be squared but uh, the author seemed to mistyped it uh, so this uh, this seems to be like reasonable thing for small epsilon values right 
Uh, and finally, yes. Uh, and finally, we uh, add uh, the empirical risk term to to this lower bound of our mutual information of our outputs and environment, and add minimization by uh, representation. And the final thing would be to notice that every global minimum of this term is local minimum of this term, because when the gradient is zero, it's a local empirical risk minimum. And then we can uh, uh, we can uh, combine those two minimization, minimization, minimizations into one and achieve something really similar to the IRM. So it's like empirical risk plus some uh, gradient squared regularization. So this is just like a side point. Uh, uh, could you please comment the, the transition from the first to the second slide? This? Uh, it seems like a very rough Approximation. Yes, it's uh, that's very what, rough. very rough, yeah, and the author also says that it's not uh, optimal. But he says that if we assume that they are like nice and convex, then everything should be all right here. It seems that they just want to, to, to get an answer they already know. Well, basically, yes, I, I also also think so. Uh, How do we get uh, the third line from the second? This, yes. because uh, this is just. Uh, the, the, the yes, just the minus gradient. Okay, so let's uh, come to the summing up. Okay, we want to learn some robust predictors that are based on true causal properties on our data, of our data and uh, do not pay attention to the spurious correlations that present in our data. Uh, for that, we notice that invariance and, and causation are quite related things and we can leverage their connection by promoting out-of-distribution generalization, as we've seen in the beginning. Uh, also, we assume that our data are sampled from different separated environments. They can vary, but all of these environments uh, preserve the same uh, causal structural equation for our outputs. And uh, finally, the IRM principle, once again, we try to find such a representation of our features that the optimal classifier on top of it would be optimal simultaneously in all environments. And here is the practical version of IRM. So, thank you very much. No, that's just version one, because there are so many things that are uh, for the future uh, directions. Uh, they, they, leave a very, they, they leave a lot of things for future studies, you know, like considering nonlinear case, like answering those questions for nonlinear case or something like that. So this is just a concept, the first one uh, that was proposed and uh, it seems that this thing will develop in further on. Okay, any more questions? So, wouldn't you say that like spurious correlations are simply an issue with the fact that we have a very high information input, a very low information target, right? If our targets would be like more complex, as in you'd be asking. So instead of just saying cow or camel, you'd be saying cow, cow eye, cow horn, grass. You're asking the system to learn about everything there is in the image. And by learning about everything there is in the image, you can't spiritually correlate. Like, as in like, when, when I look at a picture of a cow, I can also say that this is a grass, this is the cow horn, this is the cow like skin, mouth, whatever. Like I, I decompose this image into a hierarchy of different things. Mm -hmm. So if you like, ask the model to learn all the same information, then presumably you you might ameliorate, like you might decrease the problem of spurious correlations because you'd say, oh, this is grass and this is sand. Okay, yeah, I, I understand. You say he, that here's the cow and here's the background. The, you say that you when you make your problem more complex, more specific, then you will have less spurious correlations. Yes. So you will not care about the background color if you are just concentrating. No, I'm saying I want the model to learn more, and by asking the model to learn more, it, 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 it stops like 
okay, like if I'm learning, like if I just go and learning something completely new that I've never ever seen before, like let's say I'm trying to, you know, talk about Chinese uh, Chinaware or something, right? And I don't know anything about Chinese mm -hmm. Chinaware, so maybe I, 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 will, I will latch on to the most descriptive features, which are also spurious, because I don't understand the true underlying process, but. To understand the true underlying process, I need to understand all these details and then reconstruct the more general worldview from the details. Mm -hmm. So if we ask the model to do something very similar, we might stop latching onto the most descriptive features and try to, and try to actually understand the underlying process. Well, you see, those spurious features are changing, and those are like. Uh, the shape of, uh, like, I don't know, the horns, the eyes of sure, colors. Sure, yeah. They are stable. They, every, cow, every cow has horns of, the, of similar shape. So this is a stable property. This is like a causal invariant property. Okay, fine. So, <coughs> simplest thing. You do an object detection. You teach the model to do object detection plus object classification. So it has to both say what, what object this is and also cut the object out from the background. This way you teach the model that there's something in the image and something in the background. Therefore, it should learn to detect the image. It's more about seeing the very old information. Yeah, but like, but then, but then you ask it to do more things. Ask it to do more things. To predict all the pixels? Yeah, from all the pixels? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like, That's ask it to do what a human does. It's so, a very stupid question. Uh, how it can be proven that uh, the, these uh, laws, like your ROD, is uh, mm. will cause you to uh, learn uh, the casual, uh, the casual uh, predictor? So, so, are there any guarantees? Yes, uh, that's uh, exactly what we skipped. Uh, in this, uh, this is this question that you're asking, I see. And uh, uh, the authors provide some, uh, some, they shed some light on this, but again, for, for a specific linear case, and this is highly non-trivial. So they, uh, they, um, they apparently show that yes, though that ROOD, it's something that works, that actually helps us to uh, find true causal predictors but to prove that, you need to really dive into details. So the, uh, this pre presentation is just something like wave having, uh, hand waving. Yes. How many pages okay. do they have? What? How many pages do they have in the paper? 31. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, Was it accepted somewhere? Uh, what? Was it accepted somewhere? I don't know. I, d I just know that this is Facebook research. so. There. No, you, you see, this is more more like a philosophical paper. They have, they have a very, a very large. <laughs> First of all, they have a, a lot of theorems, and those theorems are not uh, trivial at all. Uh, theorems, uh, this is not philosophical paper. Uh, this is the first point, and about the philosophical, uh, about the philo philosophical point. Uh, they constructed their discussion section as a dialogue between two students that just uh, read this paper, yes, and they just eager to uh, to discuss this uh, this paper with each other, and well, actually I've never seen students that would talk like this, <laughs> but uh, they. You, you haven't seen papers like this as well. Mm, I've, seen, oh, I've seen one. Yeah. With the introduction, like a dialogue between the student and his his uh, one supervisor, yeah. and what they should do. So yeah, and those two students discuss a lot of philosophical things about why this makes sense and when this makes sense, and how is this connected to our life and. It's like what Platon dialogues. Yeah. Yes, no, not Platon, Socratic, Socratic yeah. dialogues. They. They. Ah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they call it like Socratic then. I, I ask, uh, show me ImageNet results, and if it works, then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> 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 and if it doesn't work, then like, please be like, recommend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
everything has to always be about image. Something is just, you know, somebody might not. Like no, okay, that. let's let's continue this discussion after the seminar, mm -hmm. yeah. not during the seminar. Any more questions to the to the speaker? If not, then I have one question to the audience. Who knows who will who will be our next speaker? Week? <laughs> you? Good. Maybe you also know the, the, the title, the topic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, I can I can uh, I can get something. I Don't can start say. with the dialogue between two uh. students. <laughs> just the title. Okay, just the title. Uh, why do narrow mess and learn and generalize? What is the title? Okay. Okay, this could have a dialogue. <laughs> okay, let's make a